All right, so this is The Earth and Its Peoples by Richard Bullitt, Chapter 22, The Industrial Revolution, 1760 to 1851. We'll be looking at Section 2, The Technological Revolution. So a key part to what made the Industrial Revolution possible, again, recall the Industrial Revolution is the change in the way that goods are produced and distributed, uh, was technology. Fundamentally, this is the steam engine, but also a lot of applications around it that um, you know helped really sort of facilitate this increasing efficiency in making goods, transporting goods, uh, and even uh, communication. Your textbook actually outlines pretty clearly five particular innovations that spurred industrialization, that is to make it uh, go at a, a more rapid and faster pace. Mass production through the division of labor being one, new machines being number two, an increase in the manufacturing of iron. Uh, iron was very important, especially for not just creating the steam engine itself, but a lot of uh, parts associated with mechanization. The steam engine, which we talked about, and then the electric telegraph, which of course helped with communication right so we'll talk about these things in more detail so in regards to mass production and division of layer josiah wedgwood practiced this using pottery all right so josiah wedgwood uh, used division of labor to make pottery uh, essentially what division of labor is, is that instead of one person producing something from beginning to end, that each step along the production method, somebody else is assigned with that specific task. So if we look at maybe something like pottery, uh, it might include, um, you know, to make a, a pot or a vase or whatever else you make with pottery. It might first be to mix the clay, right? then to mold it, then to uh, maybe glaze it, and then to paint it, right? So those would be all the processes and turning it into a finished product. Instead of one person mixing it, then molding it, then glazing it, then painting it, instead you hire four different people. Person number one only mixes the clay, person number two only molds the clay, person number three only glazes it, person number four only paints it. That helps make things, uh, it makes it cheaper. And it makes more of it. So you end up producing a lot more because each individual person becomes more specialized at that specific task. Uh, so this required any production method to be using simple and repetitive tasks. Again, the reward is more efficiency, All right? More efficiency. Uh, but even technology was used in uh, Wedgwood's and others' uh, production when it came to making pottery. So, for example, mixing clay, which had previously been done by hand, which was a pretty difficult process, that was done now by steam engine. And so, uh, you know, replacing one of these categories uh, through the use of new technology allowed a lot more clay to be mixed and allowed a lot more people to focus on working on these other sort of tasks that were at hand. So, uh, and this was pretty much true, this idea of dividing up labor, this was done in pretty much every single business because those businesses could produce at a much cheaper price and can produce much more in terms of quantity. But by far, probably the most significant change to happen as a result of the industrial revolution is the cotton industry otherwise referred to as textiles. A textile is any sort of cloth, right? Any sort of cloth. And so cotton, as opposed to wool, now uh, historically England had a wool industry. Wool comes from sheep. Cotton, on the other hand, is grown. It wasn't typically grown in England, so it wasn't used. But because of British colonies, Great Britain could import cotton from India and North America. And this provided really the source for the textile industry to boom. Cotton, unlike wool, was um, a lot more comfortable 
it was lighter, it was more desired by people, but on top of that, it's grown in the ground as opposed to being grown on an animal. Uh, you know, you get a lot more out of cotton for the work that you put in as opposed to something like a sheep where you have to constantly take care of it uh, until it's ready to be you know, shaved, for example. And then other technologies like the spinning jenny, again, this would have been a machine to turn cotton into thread. You know, during the proto-industrial period, spinning jennies were placed in farmers' homes. Farmers spun thread in their off time. Uh, but with the technology of steam engines, you could essentially take a spinning jenny, attach it to a steam engine, and that would allow for a lot more thread to be uh, created from cotton. Here you see on the right-hand side some very sort of early versions of various spinning jennies that were used. This was something that you would have likely seen in a place like India. This is something that you would have likely seen in a place like um, uh, England at the time. Uh, still hand spun, right? So that is essentially where the cotton would go. And then you would create a, uh, you know, some thread up in this area. Uh, this is a little bit more of a sophisticated spinning jenny. Uh, you can see that with this wheel right here, this is a little handle. And uh, by turning the handle over and over again, multiple spools of thread can be woven from this. But there were some improvements to these contraptions. Richard uh, Arkwright created the water frame, which was essentially a spinning jenny attached to a water wheel. So as opposed to a person having to, oops, uh, opposed to a person having to, con you know, spin it, spin it, spin it, spin it, if you placed a water wheel in the river, you could allow for the flow of the river to spin it. So this is what something like Arkwright would have created. And right here, right, this wheel uh, could be set up in a way so that if, you know, water was running past it, for example, it would spin around and that would produce what was needed in order to create the spools of thread from either cotton or wool, increasingly cotton. And this allowed for the creation even before uh, steam engines for what was called cotton mills. And again, these might be um, production centers on rivers. And because they required a river, um, you know, in order for the uh, power source to be used, Cotton mills were exclusively found on where waterways were. But again, even when it came to um, uh, cotton mills, there could be a lot of things preventing um, a cotton mill from producing a large amount of thread, including if the current wasn't strong enough, uh, especially in England during the winter, the water froze, so they practically didn't work. Uh, power looms essentially were uh, these sort of uh, spinning jennies or water frames, but with a steam engine, right? So we might call a power loom a steam powered textile, let's we'll call it machine. So if we go back here to our drawing and we can see, you know, this area where the water goes through, we'll instead just attach, you know, essentially a steam engine in which, you know, if you just feed the furnace enough coal, it's going to power this um, to make whatever textile it is that you need. And just to give you an idea of how profound this transformation was, right, going from handmade clothing to now power looms, 500 hours of work, right, what had taken 500 hours with handmade work now only took 80 minutes, right? So you can imagine how much more could be produced. The price of cloth fell by 90%, right? So there was more and cheaper significantly, and this allowed people to purchase goods like they never had before. Other inventors like Eli Whitney, we'll call him an inventor, helped speed up this process specifically with textiles with the cotton gin. Cotton gin removed seeds from cotton. Previously, people had to do it by hand. Now with the cotton gin, a lot more cotton could be harvested. This had a big impact specifically on the Southern United States to expand slavery. 
know, because cotton was in such high demand, because it can now be produced with power looms at, uh, again, a rate that was exponential to what it was before, because the cotton gin could remove the seeds exponentially quicker, essentially there was an exponential need for slavery. And so especially in the Southern United States, the number of slaves simply skyrocket as a result of the Industrial Revolution. Now, another contributing factor was the expansion of the iron industry. And the way that iron is produced is that it's heated and then cooled, right? You hammer out the impurities, blacksmiths, hold their blades on a very, you know, like a hot fire. They put it on the anvil. They smash the impurities out of it. They heat it up again over and over and over and over again. Iron production also increased during the industrial period. And a lot of it had to do with the transition from fuel sources. So typically in the dark ages, when iron was made, you know, knights in shining armor, it was wood that was used. But wood was not, you know, it wasn't hot enough, right? We might say that wood was relatively uh, you know, low heat, so it didn't produce a lot of energy, uh, but also was very labor intensive in terms of, of the resources. It was high volume. You know, a lot of wood was needed in order for a blacksmith to heat up to produce a significant quantity of iron. Uh, later on, coal was used. Coal is essentially, uh, you know, fossilized carbon. Uh, you get it in the ground and it produces at a much, or heats up at a much higher heat, but also is much lower in volume. So you can transport a lot more of it. You need less coal to get the same amount of heat as you do wood. Lastly, it was the production of Coke. Coke is essentially a, a byproduct of coal. So you take coal, you do some things to it, and Coke is the highest heat, high heat, and low volume, so you don't really need a lot of it. And the ability for um, you know people in England especially, but then this you know, information spread around the world, in order to get more heat out of a smaller amount of material allowed for more iron production to take place. So a huge increase in production, and we might also say a cheaper price. Uh, the amount of, or this, sort of new industrial period was on display at the Crystal Palace. The Crystal Palace was an iron and glass structure that was built in England. And it really represented kind of the future, the industrial future. You know, this was, like I said, a Crystal Palace, whereas uh, the amount of iron that was required to build something like a building just, you know, it wasn't strong enough and it wasn't been, wasn't possible before uh, some of these innovations. Uh, here, when it came to iron or iron made goods, Eli Whitney, uh, Whitney, again, our inventor, created another really ingenious concept, and that is the idea of interchangeable parts. What interchangeable parts is, is pretty much what you get from the definition is rather than creating a good, and what Eli Whitney did was he used guns, but this was used for everything, right? So rather than creating one single good, and this will be a very poorly drawn gun, right? So here's a gun. And typically when a gun producer made a gun, this was just one single giant you know, piece. Eli Whitney said, well, rather, instead of making you know, uniform pieces, why don't uh, manufacturers make their um, products a series of parts. That way, if one gets broken, and this was a problem, for example, let's say that the barrel of the gun blows up. In this case, you have to replace the whole gun. If the barrel of the bl uh, gun blows up in this instance, all you have to do is replace the barrel of the gun. And this made goods a lot easier to repair. This was especially true for things like steam engines, right? You can imagine how expensive it would be if you had to replace your entire steam engine or really your entire factory if something broke down rather than being able to replace it. Uh, it's used in everything today, right? You could just imagine something like if your car broke down, the cost it would be to replace your entire car as opposed to just replace whatever it is. And again, this was something that is so genius, it almost seems self-evident, but was very important to early industrialization because without it, the cost would have been too significant, right, this idea. And again, it was applied to everything. 
Like we mentioned before, the steam engine is probably the most important technology when it comes to the industrial period. Animal power, wind power, water power, uh, we might also put uh, human power, was all replaced essentially by fossil fuels, right? Initially coal, right, is more or less the main engine of the industrial period. A little bit later on, oil and petroleum. That doesn't come till a little bit, but first coal, then later, and petroleum. Uh, there were inventors who helped perfect the steam engine. James Watt, we might call him an inventor, who perfected, or maybe not perfected, but he significantly improved the steam engine, uh, essentially realizing that a condenser was needed to repeat the hot and cold action of it. And just to give you kind of a, a quick rundown of how a steam engine operates, uh, essentially, and this will be again, a very poor drawing, uh, you'll have something like a piston, right? And a piston is something that, uh, we'll attach it out here, give it a little gear uh, attached out here. Uh, and a piston is something that goes up and down, right? So this has the ability to move up and down, up and down, up and down. Uh, the steam engine used steam power. So you might have something like water in here. Uh, below you have a fire, right? And we might want to give our steam engine, uh, you know, something like this, right? And the idea is that as the heat builds up, right, pressure, steam comes off and pressure builds up. Once that pressure is released, the piston goes up. Once it cools back down, the piston goes back down. Uh, before James Watt, typically the steam engines required you to wait until it cooled off. He, you know, put some little doohickey uh, on it, a condenser that allowed this action to go or, or, or this, yeah, this process to go a lot, lot quicker. And then this up and down motion would be attached to a series of contraptions and gears. And again, heat, cool, heat, cool, heat, cool. And then that provides whatever source of power that is necessary. Robert Fulton put steam engine on boats, right? He was the inventor when it came to boats. Here you can see in this image, this is a ship, right? With a steam engine, you can see the smoke coming off. That would have been where the coal was being burnt. Steamships and steam engines were very important in that they were faster and could go against, so we'll say go against, either the wind or water. Uh, before this, on sailing ships, pretty much the only way to travel was by wherever nature took you. Now, for the very first time, people have the ability to, to overcome the natural world. And a lot of the Industrial Revolution is really about that. It's about people overcoming these natural barriers and natural boundaries. Steamboats in particular could go up rivers, right? So just to give you an idea of how profound and significant this revolution was, you can think of it this way. Since the dawn of humankind, people had only traveled on rivers one way, and that was the direction of the current. So from you know uh, the year you know, 1 million BCE or whatever it was, all the way up until about the year 1800, you could only sail down something like the Mississippi River. Now with this technology, with steamships and steamboats, uh, you could sail up the Mississippi River for the very first time in human history, again, faster and uh, kind of breaking through the natural barriers that had existed for a very long time. While steamships and steamboats were very, very important in overseas travel, railroads or trains, you can think of a railroad or a train as a steam engine plus a mine cart, which is essentially what it was. And trains were cheaper, faster, much more comfortable, carry more goods. Uh, in fact, it superseded any type of land transportation before that. Before trains, the best and more, most efficient way to travel by land was animal power, was horseback. The amount that a train can carry as compared to something like a horse is exponential, right? So for example, in the United States from New York to Chicago, it used to take three weeks by horse. That was down to only 48 hours. Uh, add on top of that one more layer, and that was communication, the invention of electronic telegraph, which allows you to send 
electric signals over a wire uh, made the world even smaller, right? So a telegraph would be something like you'd have to hang the wire up, right? But on two sides, you would have these people who could send electric signals back and forth via, um, via telegraph, and it would be a series of beeps. Samuel Morse invented Morse code, which was a language to communicate via telegraph, right? So for example, and I don't know what Morse code is, but for example, you know, one dot would be the letter A, two dots would be the letter B, a dot and a dash, which would be beep, beep, you'd hold it down for a little bit longer, would be the letter C, two dashes would be the letter D, so on and so forth. So when you look at all these technological innovations combined together, right, first starting off with the steam engine, then the steamboat, then the railroad, then the telegraph wire, transportation and communication significantly improve. So for example, from England to India, and then back to England again, that could take two years, right? Now, with the help of something like steamships, right, uh, canal building, and then telegraphs, that was cut down to not two years, but that was cut down to about two hours, right, especially with telegraphs. So the Industrial Revolution has the effect of making the world, in a sense, though not physically, but certainly conceptually, a much smaller place.